job, Justin. Oh, you missed a spot. Melanie! Help! <laughs> Today, it's out with the old and in with the new. Container plants, that is. I'll decide which ones are keepers and which ones are goners. And I'll go nuts for these healthy and tasty treats. Plus, I'll show you some birdhouses that hold more than just a feathery friend. Cool. With temperatures in the 20s and wind chills in the teens, it's hard to believe that within a month or so, I'll be ready to begin one of my favorite forms of gardening. Namely, growing all sorts of stuff in containers. Of course, between now and then, I got a lot of work to do. That's because many of my containers contain remnants of last year's plants, the bulk of which didn't survive the winter. So the task at hand is simple enough. I've got to remove the plants and get the containers ready for yet another season of container gardening, which is sometimes easier said than done. The easy tasks are really easy, and they involve the smaller container plantings of annuals. Like this fern growing in this elongated pot. It's often called a tom-tom pot because it looks like a cute little drum. Now, plants like this, I can just lift straight out of the pot. Top growth, roots, potting mix, and all. I'll deal with a number of other annuals of various sizes in much the same way, tossing the remains in my wheelbarrow. But as the containers get larger, my tactics change. Containers such as this, and those even larger, contain a fair amount of potting mix. So rather than dump the entire contents of the container into my wheelbarrow, I'm going to dig out the plant. That way I can salvage at least half the potting mix. The digging process may require a number of different tools, but one of my favorites is this trowel with a serrated edge. It cuts through thick roots with relative ease and allows me to lift the top growth and the bulk of the root ball out of the container while leaving the bulk of the potting mix intact. After all, potting mix isn't cheap. Now, I will go ahead and remove, oh, maybe as much as half of what's in this container, dumping that stuff in the compost pile, and then I'll add fresh potting mix when I replant. But this is a great little technique, and it translates into real savings, especially when you've got as many containers as I do. I've got a few perennials in containers, and I can deal with them in a couple of different ways. One is to simply trim the top growth of the plants and wait for them to generate new growth in spring. In fact, this Coreopsis here has already started to generate new growth. Hey, you might want to slow down a little bit there, buddy. It's cold. The other is to remove the plants from their containers and plant them directly in the ground. But given that the former approach is much easier than the latter, that's the way I'm going to go. In the process, I'll just trim the faded foliage back to the base of the plant, being careful not to damage the crown of the plant. Now, in some cases, perennials grown in containers may not survive the winter even though the plants are considered hardy in your area. And the reason is simple. Hardiness ratings, for the most part anyway, are based on plants that are grown in the ground where the roots are fully insulated. Plants grown in containers are exposed to the elements. The roots aren't fully insulated. See, I told you it was simple. Having addressed both annuals and perennials, here's the situation in which I have, or at least had, both growing in the same container. The annual in this case was a palm, and the perennial is this ivy. Now, obviously, the palm's a goner, but the ivy actually looks pretty good. So for now, anyway, I'm going to dig out the palm, being careful not to disturb the roots of the ivy too much. This way, I can stick another small palm in the pot come spring and leave the ivy intact. Uh, regarding the beret today, well, it's like my grandfather always said, when your hands and feet are cold, put on a hat. Okay. Now it's time to deal with a few evergreens in pots. These large decorative containers each house an upright arborvitae as the centerpiece, and at the base of each are low-growing, gold-tipped junipers. The arborvitaes are a bit discolored at the moment, but that's just the result of exposure to extreme cold. However, on this side of the plant, you can see there are a lot of dead branches, and I'm to blame for that. I forgot to rotate the containers during the growing season so that the entire plant received even light. So I'm going to remove the dead growth, rotate the containers, and hope that new growth will balance things out a bit. As for the junipers, they look okay, but I'm going to trim them up a bit as well, because much like the arborvitaes, those that didn't get enough sun suffered. This Hinoki cypress looks great, and I'm going to leave it in its container for at least another season. Ditto this juniper, and this adorable pine, and this cute camisiparis. 
Of course, I could plant these evergreens directly in the ground if I wanted to. And in most parts of the country, the best time to do that is either in early fall or late winter. But even if I wanted to plant these today, I couldn't, because the ground is frozen. And come to think of it, so am I. So to get my blood flowing, I'm going to put all the plant remains and potting mix in my wheelbarrow to good use. That means chopping it all up with a machete and dumping it all in the compost pile. With that task complete, I'll turn the pile with a hay fork. Now remember, to cook properly, a compost pile needs oxygen. And come to think of it, so do I. It also needs moisture, so even during the winter months, it's a good idea to check the moisture content of the pile and add a little water when necessary, just so you can maintain the consistency of, well, a wrung out sponge. And now I've got one last thing to consider regarding all my containers. To clean or not to clean, that is the question. If your plant showed visible signs of damage from fungal disease during the growing season, whether in the form of powdery mildew, rust, or black spot on leaf surfaces, then you should probably scrub your pots well and disinfect them with a solution containing one part bleach and nine parts water. But if they didn't show signs of disease, you can simply scrub your pots with a brush and skip the disinfecting process. Well, now that I've got all my containers cleaned up and ready for yet another season of container gardening, about all I can do is sit back and wait for the weather to warm up a bit. Of course, I think I'll do my sitting back inside because I need to warm up a bit myself. Man, is it ever cold. Ooh. Flavored, sliced, or diced, I just can't get enough of this protein-packed snack. Plus, I've got a cool way to hide your unsightly speakers. It's 30 Days of Holidays on HGTV, and we're wrapping up our Facebook page with your holiday photos. Upload your pics today at HGTV.com slash holiday ideas. In just a few hours, all those Welch's Concord grapes will be juice. And that's good because squeezing right after picking maximizes palate pleasure. Of course, how Welch's squeezes these grapes is important, too. They use the pulp, the skin, the seeds, everything. To make 100% grape juice loaded with antioxidant power. Plus, there's no sugar added, because when nature gives you a perfect recipe, you don't mess with it. Welch's, 100% grape. During times like these, it seems like the world will never be the same. But there is a light beginning to shine again. The spark began where it always begins, at a restaurant downtown, in a shop on Main Street, a factory around the corner. Entrepreneurs like these are the most powerful force in the economy. They drive change, and they'll relentlessly push their businesses to innovate and connect. As we look to the future, they'll be there ahead of us, lights on, showing us the way forward. This is just the beginning of the reinvention of business. And while we're sure we don't know all the answers, we do know one thing for certain. We want to help. Come see what the beginning looks like at openforum.com. It plays. It stows. It slides, it saves, it sees, it calls, and it costs less than 30 grand. We gave it more ideas per square inch because more is what we do. Introducing the Terrain, the all-new smaller SUV from GMC. HGTV invites you inside the homes of Jewel, Kathy Lee Gifford, and Holly Robinson Pete in an all-new special, Celebrity Holiday Homes. Christmas is extraordinarily important to me. Oh, they are going to love this. I like how the tree brought together oh, all the different styles. I'm so pleased. It's oh. lovely. Enjoy the traditions and share in the celebrations on Celebrity Holiday Homes, tonight at 8, 7 central. Part of 30 Days of Holidays on HGTV. From simply salted to mouth-watering wasabi and soy sauce, I'm just nutty for these little protein powerhouses. Mm. And to learn how almonds go from this to this, I'm going straight to the source. They're a really pretty hardy tree, and they can take uh, quite a bit of abuse and keep on growing. Mel Machado knows a thing or two about these hardy trees. 
He works for Blue Diamond Growers in Sacramento, California. Yep, it's uh, got a pretty good crop this year, which uh, we're seeing all around the state this year. That's great. So this is a good year. This is a good year. We're having a good year. A good year for Mel is at least a ton per acre. That's enough to fill over 5,300 six-ounce cans. That's nuts. But in order to get that kind of crop, he'll need a little help from these guys. Weather conditions are really critical since we are pollinated by honeybees, and uh, those bees need good weather in order to fly. So what do you got there, Mel? We've got a branch of the non furl variety that I cut off on the way up here this morning. And uh, it's the variety that really is the most versatile nut that we have. We can do just about anything to this. This is the one that you'll find in the stores that's uh, best for snacking. And this is the butte variety. And a very tight clustering variety. And you can see that it has a lot more nuts on it. It's a butte. It's a butte. Yeah, it's a very nice variety. It's used a lot in the, in the candy market. Now is a question I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times. So here comes a thousand and one. Okay. Almond or almond? Well, I say they're almonds if you eat them, and almonds if you grow them, and nuts if you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Call them what you will, but I just can't seem to get these babies to fruit in my Zone 6 garden. What gives, Mel? What you're looking for is a Mediterranean climate. You want uh, cold winters, but not below about 25, 26 degrees in the wintertime when the, the tree is dormant. Once it starts to begin blooming, which here in California, it's about the middle of February, we're going to see the first open flowers on a normal kind of year. Once that process starts, you want nothing below freezing, nothing below 32. California has the perfect climate for growing almonds. And it better, since it produces 100% of commercial almonds in the U.S. Over two-thirds of California almonds are exported to 95 different countries. But don't worry, there's still plenty left for us. Do you have aggressive pruning practices or anything, or you just let them go? That's actually becoming uh, somewhat of a controversy. Traditionally, uh, the growers have been pruning these trees and, and removing about a fifth of the wood every year because almonds produce on one to five-year-old wood. Lately, there's been a, quite a bit of research done by the university that's talking about no pruning or minimal pruning. Uh, what we're trying to do is get somewhat of an open-like structure to get the light through that tree and get it all the way down into the canopy. So really, pruning becomes an experience in light management. All of this talk of aggressive pruning is making me hungry. Let's move on to the good stuff. When can we harvest? If you're blooming the uh, middle of February to the, the later variety is the middle of March, the first harvest here in California is going to be right near the end of July. We normally get our first loads from the huller shellers out in the fields between the 5th and the 15th of August. And that harvest will continue on into, oh, the middle, first part of the middle of October, and then we're done out in the fields. Just how do they get nuts off the tree without picking them off one by one, you might ask? Easy. Just give the tree a little shake, shake, shake. And then it winds up here. Winds up ultimately here, yeah, but it has to be hauled or shelled first. This is the production plan. Mel handed me off to his associate, Matt Lopez, who has kindly agreed to walk me through the cleaning and shipping process, step by noisy step. All right, Matt, what's going on here? Next, we move along to the de-stoner machine. As the name suggests, it removes any stones that might have tagged along from the field or anything else heavier than an almond. This hungry machine usually removes about six pieces of foreign material per 100 pounds. From there, you're going to go ahead and go over to what we call our uh, gravity table. Um, it has graders in there that will separate it by size, but it also takes the larger, heavier kernels to one side and the small kernels to the other. Let's go look at that. Your product here is going to go for further cleaning, really. Electronic sorting equipment. We're going to get some scraps taken out of it to clean it up as far as appearance. State-of-the-art electronic sorting machines use different colored lasers against a solid background to identify color differentials in the almonds. This helps them get rid of foreign materials and nuts with insect damage, chips, or scratches. Pretty cool. At what point am I going to get to eat an almond? Uh, let's wait till it gets cleaned up and we get a good clean almond. We're still, we're still uh, working it and trying to get it to that level uh, right now. I better not have to wait too much longer. Watching a steady stream of superfood, taking the stairs, plus calisthenics, equals a very hungry Paul. What now, Matt? Well, now we're on our what we refer to as our final sorting belts. 
Uh, these are going to be the final eyes on the product for form material removal. But up until this point, you've relied on extremely expensive, sophisticated equipment to do the job. And yet, ultimately, it still comes down to this. Uh, down to this, but you see here, we only have two ladies or a single lady on each belt. Uh, at one time, these belts would have been lined with ladies. So these are safety. This is a clean product here. Most of the time, it's already down to our one in a thousand, one to 500. By this point, we just want to have the final eyes before it goes to pack out. I finally got an almond. Once these ladies give the almonds their seal of approval, they either go straight into flavoring and shipping or off to be sliced and diced, blanched, or slivered. After holding back all day, I just can't help myself. I'm just nuts for almonds. Delicious. Coming up, I'll show you some birdhouses that are more than meets the eye. At your wit's end with weeds, I'll show you some tips to tackle those rascals before they know what hit them. It's 30 days of holidays on HGTV, and this season, we're giving you more. More all-new specials, more seasonal ideas. And no one else has this much. Every day. It's 30 days of holidays on HGTV. It's 30 days of holidays on HGTV, and HGTV.com slash holidays is your online home to get in the spirit. Festive ideas are a snap with our Deck the Halls feature, and check out our gift guide. It's all at HGTV.com slash holidays. Salon Pass Pain Relief Patch presents the Ow My Aching Back Patch. The Just One More Time Patch. Salon Pass gives you the pain relieving power of a pill in a patch. It's ultra thin, ultra flexible, and Salon Pass is the only FDA approved OTC pain patch. It goes right to the side of your pain. It's the Keeping Up with Johnny patch and the Boy Do I Feel Better patch. Get the power of a pill in a patch. Also try Salon Pass Arthritis Pain. What terrifying discovery would make the Vatican turn to Robert Langdon? Destruction of Vatican City through life. Don't miss Tom Hanks in Angels and Demons. For Kate and Brad. Merry Christmas, Mom. Hey, Dad. Good to see you, oh, Mom. Merry hey, Christmas, Dad. The holidays are a real nightmare. Order four Christmases tonight. Watch the latest movies. Find them here in your on-demand menu. With on-demand from Comcast, you get entertainment on your terms. Compare hundreds of travel sites at once. Kayak. Search one and done. <laughs> Their hands might be small, but they have big imaginations. That's why Lego Duplo was created, designed especially for your children. When building with Lego Duplo bricks, children develop fine motor skills. And when playing, they improve their social skills as they build their own world of fun. Lego Duplo. Build a new adventure every day. Each set sold separately. Would you like a pony? Yeah. Would you like a pony? Yeah. Here you go. This is for you. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Well, you didn't say you could have a real one. Well, you didn't ask. <laughs> Even kids know it's wrong to hold out on somebody. Why don't banks? We're Ally, a new bank that alerts you when your money can be working harder and earning more. It's just the right thing to do. Salon Pass gives you the pain-relieving power of a pill in a patch. It's the only FDA-approved OTC pain patch. It works right where it hurts. Feel better fast. Get the power of a pill in a patch. Salon Pass. Ah, don't you just love the sound of music in your backyard? But these days, backyards are more than just a haven for birds, bugs, and plants. The backyard is an entertaining space. It's an outdoor room. It's a, an extension of the house. It just doesn't have a, a ceiling. Speakers can be the perfect backyard accessories for setting the mood for a party or just hanging out. But they can also stick out like a sore thumb. Typically, when you look at outdoor speakers, they often look like little shoe boxes that are stuck up under the eaves. And you know exactly what they are, and they aren't aesthetically really the greatest looking thing. Well, it's... Peter Whiteley from Sunset Magazine has a great idea for camouflaging those speakers. Put them into birdhouses. Genius! I thought, well, let's 
make them totally invisible and put something in your backyard that you wouldn't question being there. You mean build a birdhouse from scratch? You don't have to be a fine woodworker. There's something forgiving about a birdhouse. It, it's crude somewhat. Uh, you can paint them or you can just use natural wood. All you need is a good speaker. I had this one around my home. It's an old TV speaker that I had that hooked up my stereo. Or you might have an old boom box with separate speakers. You could use those. And some old wood that may be lying around your house. I also found some really handsome old fencing that had some weathering to it. For this size little speaker that I have, I could build the whole birdhouse using two six-foot fence boards. There are no rules here. That's the neat part about it. There's no rule on size. There's no rule on how it's going to look. Cutting the wood pieces to fit around your speaker is key. It's just like making a gingerbread house. You've got a floor base, two end walls. Here, I just have a 90-degree corner, and it's centered over the middle of this little board so that it's a very simple shape to cut. And two side walls. The sides, I rip the board slightly here so that it would match the the pitch so when it fits together it'll be a nice clean look. Peter cuts a hole out of the floor base making a picture frame for the speaker so that the sound has somewhere to go. Trust me, your neighbors will appreciate you for it. The thing that's neat about these birdhouses is that they drive the, the sound down. They don't aim out. and It sort of bounces off the walls or the ground and spills out kind of like ripples of, of water. Stapling a netting screen onto the base will keep the speaker from falling through the hole. So now I'm ready to build the little birdhouse. I put the side walls on end and I'm going to glue and nail the top on. So the first thing I'm going to do now is to run a little bit of woodworking glue along the top here. If you're using old wood or warped wood, make sure to drill pilot holes before you hammer in the nails or drive in screws. And try not to do this. Of course, no birdhouse would be complete without a bird hole, but it's just for show. No birds allowed in here. Peter covers the hole with a small piece of particle board. So now I have a see-through birdhouse, and what's going to happen is that I'm going to mount it to the base like this. I'm going to use four screws so that you can take this apart and have access to the speaker if anything goes wrong in time. You'll want to hook up your speaker before placing it in the birdhouse. Once inside, it's easy to keep in place. You could cut some little wooden shims that would help just slide against the sides and ends to pretty much lock it in place. So now I've got the speaker inside, the wire's coming out the back, and I'm ready to add the roof. The bird's really anxious to get in. A roof made out of aluminum flashing is always good for waterproofing purposes. If you want a shingle roof, these wood wedges will do the trick. I happen to have found some really nice big old heavy cedar shakes that we have here at our workplace, and I'm going to make these into the roof. Remember, precise measuring and cutting are key to having a perfectly angled roof. So hopefully these should fit together along the ridge here. Since this is basically just two 45 degree angles, I think I'm going to throw a little glue on here just to make sure that it's reasonably watertight. Just a few more screws and Peter's tweeter is ready for show and tell. This one's going on the wall. How? Screw a small beveled piece of wood to the wall. Then cut and attach a couple of wood brackets to the back of the birdhouse like this, and voila! There you are, ready for occupancy or tunes. Who says these charming nest boxes are just for the birds? Next, how to win the war with weeds. It's a full house for the holidays, and Sandra knows just how to get this family into the spirit. Catch the new special Sandra Lee Celebrate Season of Surprise, Saturday night at 8, 7 central. It's all part of 30 Days of Holidays on HGTV. <laughs> new from Crayola, it's the Color Explosion Glow Dome, a spinning, glowing dome that brings all your best ideas to life. The Color Explosion Glow Dome and other great gift ideas from Crayola. Crayola, give everything imaginable. While riding his bike, my eight-year-old fell off and broke two permanent teeth. 
Our dentist said we could come by his house since his office was closed for the weekend. And that night, he was able to treat my son right in his own kitchen. I'll admit, I haven't seen a bill. But with service like that, I don't care how much it costs. Save money and time by choosing health professionals you can trust. To see reviews from consumers near you, visit Angie'sList.com today. Love is a treasure. Trezor Lancome. The gift she will treasure. The Trezor Passions gift set. Exclusively at Macy's. You know, I sell tools. Tools are uncomplicated. Nothing complicated about a pair of 10-inch hose clamp pliers. You know what's complicated? Shipping. Shipping's complicated. Not really. With priority mail flat rate boxes from the Postal Service, shipping's easy. If it fits, it ships anywhere in the country for a low flat rate. That's not complicated. No. Come on. But a handshake? Right here. Right. Right. <laughs> priority mail flat rate boxes. Only from the Postal Service. A simpler way to ship. Your mouth is amazing. Did you know 40% of tooth surface is hidden between teeth, providing a perfect hiding place for bacteria? That's why Aquafresh invented Isoactive Whitening, a breakthrough gel that transforms into an active foam. It not only protects between teeth, it removes three times more bacteria as it whitens. Go beyond toothpaste. New triple protection Isoactive Whitening from Aquafresh. Amazing. First time home buyers are still leaping into the market. Here we come, here we go. And real estate expert Sandra Rinamato shows them the way. We want to establish market value for this home. With an entire hour of property virgins, get Sandra's no nonsense advice. Budget for a renovation down the road. That'll take you from the hunt Whoa. to your first home. Sign right here, the house is yours. Property virgins, tomorrow night at 8, 7 central, part of HGTV's first time home buyers hour. The other day, I couldn't help but chuckle as I watched my neighbor apply a pre-emergent herbicide. It wasn't that he was using the wrong product or the wrong technique or anything like that. What made me chuckle was that his timing was all wrong. Well, that and the fact that he was wearing a pair of really goofy-looking shorts. You see, he was applying a pre-emergent herbicide at least two weeks after the most common lawn weeds had already emerged, which defeats the whole purpose of applying a pre-emergent. Pre-emergent herbicides must be applied before weeds appear to have any real effect because they work by preventing weed seeds from germinating in the first place. Can bet anyone? If you wait until after the weeds emerge, the herbicide won't have any effect. And yet millions of Americans do just that, which not only results in a waste of money, but in many cases results in considerable pollution of the soil, the groundwater, and nearby rivers, lakes, and oceans. And so timing is critical. Now I know that many of you have heard that you should time the application of pre-emergent herbicides to certain botanical events, such as daffodils or forsythias in bloom. You've heard that, haven't you, Marley? Well, that's bad information, folks, because by the time these beauties are in bloom, most of the weeds will have already emerged. So this year, note when the weeds begin to sprout and backtrack two or three weeks. That's when you should apply a pre-emergent. Of course, if you miss the window of opportunity for applying a pre-emergent herbicide, you can always apply a post-emergent herbicide. And again, as the name makes clear, post-emergent herbicides work by destroying already established weeds. But be careful. Some post-emergent herbicides are selective, meaning they only target specific weeds, while others are non-selective, which means they destroy anything and everything green, whether weeds, your grass, flowers, shrubs, well, you get the idea. So read the product label. And let me make one thing perfectly clear. You'll never get rid of all the weeds in your lawn anyway. Wind will blow seeds from nearby lawns into your lawn. Birds will deposit them here and there. Even kids running from one lawn to the next will transport weed seeds on their shoes. So do what you feel you must to battle the weeds in your lawn, but do it wisely. Use all natural pre-emergent herbicides made from corn gluten. Use all natural post-emergents made from horticultural vinegar and clove oil. Raise the deck height of your mower at least one notch to prevent the weed seeds from germinating in the first place, and fertilize twice a year to promote a vigorous turf that'll choke out most of the weeds. That's what I do. You can too. To learn more about weed control or anything else you've seen on today's show, go to hgtv.com slash the greatest gardening show in the history of television. Well, actually, that's slash gardening by the yard. <laughs>